I wanted to start by thanking everyone for joining us. We are finally opening up Lipedema Lectures and uh, Lipedema to ASPS, and so I really appreciate everybody joining. Um, I'm going to focus on a little bit of what we do, and I take care of a lot of high BMI patients because of lipedema, and we do it as an outpatient procedure. And so I wanted to talk to people about sort of the safety things that we're looking at, and um, maybe it'll spark some interest in sort of uh, in, in some other things that we do also. But anyway, we'll go ahead. So today's talk will be anesthetic and perioperative considerations in outpatient and high BMI patients. So the typical general anesthetic that all of us have known for a very, very, very long time. And of course, we tell people, don't eat after midnight. Um, we give them all prescriptions for, uh, you know, Percocet, Valium, opioids, benzos. And it's been kind of the standard. It's been the staple. Um, intra-op, obviously, we give people a lot of in inhalation gases. That's obviously the standard and tried and true. And um, we give a lot of opioids also for pain control whenever you see any of their blood pressure or something change. Um, Post-op, again, they're taking what we give them. So if we give them opioids and then we're giving them that from throwing up, then we give them antiemetics and we just keep doing this. It's like the vicious cycle over and over and over again. The problem is that as you can see, and as we know, the opioid epidemic is real. Um, it, it's real. It, it, there's a lot going on, especially out in California. They're looking at um, how we doc, how we actually give per, how we give any opioids, and um, the medical board will come after you nowadays. It, it's really it's really an interesting dynamic. Um, but more importantly, we know how bad it is, and also we know how people feel on them and how they do after surgery. And so we figure it out if we can not use them, we find this better. Um, there's a lot of opioid deaths. Um, and of course, heroin, you know, people then get abused of them and they go on heroin and stuff like that. But also, listen, this happens with everyone. This happens with professionals. This happens with doctors, lawyers, dentists. I mean, it, once you start having pain and you start getting treated with opioids, there's a good chance that something is going to uh, take place, you know, and continue. The issue with being typical. So as we know, it, opioids make people feel bad. They actually make me itch. They don't make me feel great. I always joke around with my patients and I say, you know, I can't even get addicted to the good stuff. It, I, I feel terrible with it. We know that there's a lot of nausea and vomiting. We know that there's respiratory depression. I mean, that's obviously in higher doses, it gets worse. And then we take care of patients with sleep apnea and a high BMI. Um, and then of course we want patients to walk after surgery and be active and you know, this is something that makes you just want to lay down and relax and sleep. So, you know, as I said, what we're looking at, especially in California, is there is definitely increased provider liability. But overall, we know it's not the best thing for our patients. When you're looking at lipedema patients, one of the hardest things that we deal with is that they all have a very high BMI, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, but they also are chronic pain. I mean, this is why they come to us for treatment, is that everything really, really hurts them. However, most are not on prescription opioids, which is actually a really good thing. They're all high-functioning people, and they just, I would say they're tough. They deal with the pain. They all want, to, they all want relief, and so it's, we found a way to obviously do that for them surgically. Um, they know more about their own disease than most physicians and than most people in the world. So it's uh, some of that is education. Some of that is why we're doing this. But but overall, they're very, very intelligent. They know everything. And the other interesting thing is that they rarely have greater than one comorbidity. Uh, it, it's rare for us to actually see any issues with them. Um, you know, somebody can be 350 pounds, and I do tell them they're healthier than I am. So, and so it's really, you don't really see that. So that's why BMI doesn't really. Work for things. 
So speaking of BMI, the problem you, we run into is everybody has cutoffs and everybody says, oh, you know, 30 is a great number, 33 is a great number, 35. The reality is a lot of people that you know, and, and possibly myself, I'm probably a 35. I haven't weighed myself, but BMI for me is a terrible, terrible number. I, I hope in the future we actually stop using it and get rid of it completely. I think there's a lot more intelligent ways to risk stratify people. Um, and if you look at it, BMI was not really meant to be used this way, but it, we are where we are. So the problem is though, lipidema does not correlate with BMI. So I have patients with a BMI of 50, 60, you know, crazy, some even higher, some crazy numbers. The problem is it, it's not a weight loss thing. They're not gonna be able to just get rid of that weight. And that's not gonna make some, that's not gonna be safer for them also. And so it, it's really, really a challenge with these patients. And so, and it's also a challenge for them too, because it's easy when they go see a doctor and they say, ah, oh, your BMI is 45, lose it to 30, and then I'll take care of you. Well, that's not gonna work with lipedema. I do talk to patients though about risk versus benefit. And I do tell them that obviously there is a higher risk of surgery, not only because of BMI, it, there's a risk because it's connective tissue disease, there's a lot more that goes into this. Um, but the benefit is a lot of my patients are not using walkers anymore. They're, they've, they're, they've gone on with their lives. And in fact, they probably are, they're actually living a better life now and they're more productive and not on disability. So overall, you do have to look at that and talk to your patients about. The new typical. So this is one of the, the best parts about, um, I guess I'll say us uh, working together. Or uh, especially with my, my chief of anesthesia, um, who happens to be a PhD and she happens to be, she runs the training program at USC. Um, the best thing is we, we do look at how we can get better with this. And, and it's really a team effort. It's not just a team effort on our part, it's including the patient, including everybody together. We do talk to people about the pain control and expectations. I mean, we tell them that we don't use opioids. We don't use it during surgery and we try to never ever use them after surgery. So we, we think know about that. We give them clear guidelines. We talk about that. We have um, the QR codes and things like that. Like we, anything to do to give them more information. That's just, they just wanna know. They just really want to know what to do and what to expect. We start our pain control early. The night before surgery, they take um, one gram of Tylenol and they take 300 milligrams of gabapentin. And then the day of surgery, even if it's first thing in the morning, they take that same thing again. This is before they have surgery. Intraop care, we've actually changed a lot of this and we've tailored this. We've actually, um, my anesthesiologist wanted different things. We actually changed our ventilator. So our ventilators now have pressure support and pressure control. It allows for helping take care of people with higher BMI. And the honest thing is I have to put patients prone. You know, I really have to get to the back of their bodies to really, to really take care of them. Um, we have a video scope. I, I think it's great. I think you should have one anyway. Um, I always joke around with them and say they're cheating when they use it, but the reality is we do have some patients, and not only lipedema patients, this could be for anyone. Difficult airway can come on at any time, and so it's really nice to have that there for them. Um, but most important thing also is, again, it's the whole team effort, the circulators, the nurses, like all of us, we're all together. We know exactly what's going on. We know exactly when things are going to happen, and so we can all be available. Our crash cart is right next to our stuff. I mean, just, just if we ever... We're over-prepared is what I tell people to be. Our intra-op care has really, really, um, it's been great actually. So uh, I haven't used gas anesthesia in over six years, I think it is now. So I stopped using gas anesthesia. I do TIVA, which is total intravenous anesthesia, and it really has helped with our post-op nausea and wake-ups and things like that, which is with mainly propofol. However, we've really advanced what we're doing now. We really look at opioid sparing techniques. We, do, we use propofol, of course, to keep people asleep, but we use ketamine. We use dexmedetomidine, which is Presidex, and we actually mag use magnesium. 
Uh, we don't use lidocaine. There's protocols that have lidocaine. We don't use that because we're giving so much lidocaine with, uh, and we'll talk about that later with tamesin and everything else. But, you know, using these type of things, you can actually get great pain control for people and keep them kind of rock solid during surgery. And it actually works even after surgery. So it's really, really, a, you know, it's really great techniques to use. And I, I highly, highly recommend it. As, we, as we're looking at it, we're doing this, the things you have to worry about or not really worry, but listen, Presidex, the dexmedetomidine, it will decrease your heart rate, increase respiratory rate. So, you know, one thing that people will worry about is, okay, are, you know, is the patient reacting to something? The reality is that they're not, they're really, or reacting to something I'm doing when they're really reacting to what the anesthetic is doing. So you just have to be aware. You, some people might see that and say, oh my God, there's something wrong. Give them, you know, give them they're having pain, give them some pain medications. So you gotta be careful. Uh, we don't use inhalation gases. I stopped this a long, long, long time ago. Um, gases are fat soluble. They stay in the body for days after surgery. That's why people feel like they get hit by a Mack truck, even sometimes for smaller surgeries. You know, two, three days later, they're still kind of out of it. So we, we just, I stopped using them a long time ago. And then, of course, this is going to be worse when someone has a high BMI and they've got a lot of places they can store this stuff. We also use a, a sedline monitor, which I, I think is amazing. So it actually gives us continuous brainwave function. So on top of everything else that we're doing, we can actually see how deep the patient is and how awake they are. So it really helps us tailor things. You know, I, I don't, we'll talk about this later, but I don't paralyze patients. Like we want to keep people as functioning as possible. And then of course our, I'll say adjunct pain control. So the tumescent that I typically use, I use uh, three liter bags. We actually use a lot of tumescent on people. So we just put it into three liters instead of liter over and over. So we'll each, each, each bag will have, each three liter bag will have 300 milligrams of lidocaine, um, marcaine or pivocaine, whichever is available based on backwards stuff. But we put about 150 milligrams of that in. We do use epinephrine, we use TXA, and um, the thing that I've learned is the, sometimes more important than the lidocaine, the marcaine, the epinephrine is actually just to achieve turgor. Um, if you can really, you know, exsanguinate the area, you're going to decrease, uh, decrease your chance of bleeding, of course. And so, you know, I do think I, I do use a lot of tumescent fluid in areas. And then our post-op care, everything we do just flows. Everybody's together on the same page. As soon as they are finished with surgery, we, st we have them start drinking. I mean, they're, they're actually getting up and walking pretty quickly too. Our pain medication right away is we do give them Tylenol and we give them the gabapentin again. Um, I use Toradol for a lot of the patients. Uh, I know people worry about bleeding and stuff like that. I, I don't really worry so, so much about it. So I do use Toradol patients. Obviously, you got to be careful with renal failure things, but, but overall, I do like Toradol. Um, we have people eating and drinking, and we encourage that before surgery, encourage it after surgery so they know exactly what to do. Of course, the old adage from every plastic surgeon is to say, hey, get up and walk. You got to walk. You got to walk. You're always calling people. Walk, 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 walk. And so I've kind of gotten to the point where they don't listen. <laughs> so no matter what you say, so I just do kind of the opposite, or I, I kind of help them along. So we give them a lot of IV fluids during surgery. The typical patient can, uh, even in a couple hour surgery, can get three to four liters sometimes and some other stuff. But what that does is that night, especially the first night after surgery, they're up every 15 to 20 minutes walking around. It's the best DBT prophylaxis you're ever, ever going to use. They are up peeing and they can't sit in bed to do it. And so it's really just great. Um, and then, of course, if they do have some breakthrough pain or something, we, 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 we try to go more towards Tylenol than we do. Per except for anything. Typically, on our post-op day one, patients can come, especially lipidema patients, they have garments on. So obviously, we want to take things down and take a look at everything, see the drains, see how their skin looks. And so we do tell people to take the gabapentin ahead of coming here on purpose. 
Um, we do tell them, you know, even after they can continue with uh, gabapentin and Tylenol. I give patients um, gabapentin, Tylenol, and ibuprofen. Those are the prescriptions that we give them. I'm fine with ibuprofen, even for, you know, skin cutting procedures and open things. I'm totally fine with that. And so I, I really prefer they use that. And then, of course, I talk to them prior to surgery about their diet and, and how they're going to do things. Most of these patients have been starving themselves their whole life. And uh, I, I can do an, a three-hour lecture just on that aspect alone. So I tell people after surgery, three regular meals a day and three protein shakes in between those regular meals. And I, I check on that. We all check on that. We, we, they kind of know. And so they know it's really something we're going we're gonna to make them do. We're also extremely transparent about pain and, and about what to expect. Um, what I tell people is they are, it's an interesting surgery because a lot of patients come to you not in pain and you're operating with them and causing pain. These are patients that are coming to you because they have pain and you're hoping to operate to reduce their, or you know, remove their pain. So it's really, it's kind of a, a different dynamic to think about. Um, I tell them, and I, it's kind of the way I say it, I say the first four to six hours after surgery is no bueno. I promise you it's going to hurt. Uh, I'm taking up fibrotic tissue. We're opening up nerves and things that have been trapped forever. It is definitely going to hurt. Um, what they'll find, though, as they start doing their walking, especially to the bathroom, is that they actually feel better when they're walking, the compression and everything. So this is where they really, really do great. And they learn, we obviously tell them that, but then they learn it pretty quickly too. And that whole, there's always walking around. They're never stopping. But again, this is where opioids would be um, counterproductive to this because they keep people in bed, passed out, sleeping. We don't want that at all. The interesting thing when I tell people, I said, the first four to six hours after surgery is definitely no fun. Every patient comes in the next day for their, their post-op and they all say, I'm sore, but not in pain, which is really great. I always tell people, sore is Advil Tylenol. Pain is narcotics, and they really don't need it. You know, you're dealing with neuropathic pain. Gabapentin is a great medication for people. But of course, we do want to set their expectations early. That soreness and everything, it is, most of the patients I do multiple procedures on, so I would say the first one's the hardest because we're going to figure things out, figure out how much pain they're in and stuff like that. But overall, again, let them know exactly what you're thinking and what typically happens so that they understand and they don't think something bad is happening to them also. We're obviously really big on DBT prophylaxis. I mean, part of the stuff that we do so obviously, I give patients sub Q heparin prior to induction. Uh, we use SCD and TED hose. The problem with SCDs and TED hose is that most times I'm operating on the extremities and sometimes all four at once. So we might have to move things around. But the reality is, if you see somebody that has lipedema, even if you put the SCDs on or TED hose on them, it's not really doing anything. There's so much tissue between you know, their skin and where the, the vessels are, that I, it's not really doing that much for them. So, um, of course, we still do it as, as much as we can for them. Um, but I just, it's just, you know, it's just really tough. Um, our blood, same thing with our blood pressure cuff. You know, we do move it around during the surgery so you get to different areas. But, again, if you try to take blood pressure on these patients, it's very, very challenging to get an accurate reading. Before surgery, during surgery, it's just really hard. Um, I do use Xeralto. I give people, um, you know, um, anticoagulants for seven days after surgery. Uh, once in a while, I'll do it longer if they're, uh, let's say they, they aren't walking as much, but, but typically that's what we do. And again, I do this with tummy tucks. I do it with my thigh lifts, arm lifts. I just, I, I just find I'd rather deal with more bruising or something like that than I then deal with the DVT and the PE. And so, and again, you heard about my forced ambulation, which is basically making them pee all night long. Actually, the other part that we do also, though, is during our surgeries, we don't paralyze people. So we keep people, essentially, people are breathing on their own. Their mind is out, so it's considered general anesthesia. But other than that, they're really, we don't, we don't keep them hypotensive. We don't paralyze them. 
we want them functioning, I hate to say it, as much as possible. This has become really important, and I'm sure um, those of you that work in hospital systems or work in hospitals or, you know, you've heard about the ERAS protocols, and it, it's really a good idea. I mean, it's really looking at, you know, how we can better get people through this. We, we've got, we've done a lot of this already, but we're always looking to improve. So I'll kind of show you what, what we do. So far and what we haven't done so well. So. What we have achieved so far are education counseling. I barely see any patients that smoke and the alcohol cessation, I'll be honest, um, I don't tell people to stop drinking. I mean, you know, if they want to have a glass of wine before surgery, I'm totally fine with that. So, but obviously if there's a problem, that's a totally different thing. Um, multidisciplinary team. So you can see this, I mean, my anesthesiologist, myself, our nurses, like we're all part of the same team and we all work together in many, many realms, not just what we each do. Um, our cardiopulmonary assessment, this is huge. Obviously, we, if any patients have any heart issues, lung issues, we always get cleared from their doctor as well too. But um, <clears throat> one of the things that we've learned also recently is um, um, when patients have had COVID, there is a chance that they're going to have more lung, uh, we'll call it scarring for lack of better words, or harder to breathe, even if they don't really realize it. So I never used to get chest x-rays on every patient, but now we do. Um, and of course, our DVT venous, venous thromboprophylaxis. Um, Preoperative fasting, carbohydrate-rich loading, we're getting there. I'll kind of talk about our diet and what we tell people to do. The things that we are not good at and that we are striving, that's our next phase of things, is about preoperative nutrition. I focus on post-op nutrition. I do talk to patients about pre-op nutrition, but I don't really enforce it as much as I need to. And then pre-rehabilitation. Um, it, it's interesting. You know, the better patients are prepared for the surgery that they're having, they just seem to do better. The other successes we have achieved, intra-op, this is, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm so happy. It's the best I've ever really been in my career where I feel like we're doing the right thing for people. Our surgical approach is always planned out, our anesthetic management, our fluid management, prevention of hypothermia. We have actually pads that are built into the, um, the OR tables that warm, of course, blankets and everything. Um, I still keep the room a little bit cold, though, but, but all, of course, the patient is the most important. And then post-op, again, we're really, really, we really hit on this. And, and we did this even before the ERS protocols. Patients are up walking around. We do use drains. They typically come out very, very quickly. But more importantly, we want them to eat. We want them taking, we want them to pain control, but not something that's going to make them sleep. Um, and of course, if there is nausea or vomiting, I'll, I'll tell you, we almost never see nausea and vomiting at all with our patients. It, it is it's probably one in 500 patients will come in and, and have and be nauseous. And typically, if you press them, it'll be they did not eat and they took their antibiotics and stuff like that. So, but yeah, we rarely ever see that. And of course, postoperative glycemic control, that's important for diabetes, important for, for, important for everyone. Everyone anyway. Um, Things that we've learned as we've done this. So, of course, again, our staff undergoes, we're, we're, we're in a small practice, we're in private practice. So that's why I want to talk about outpatient surgery. But we actually do nurse training. Uh, we kind of, you know, mimic exactly what USC does. Um, but more importantly, everybody understands their role and also understands the protocols we're trying to achieve and also understands what everybody else is doing too. Um, the things you got to watch out for again, but the nurses know, and we've been doing this long enough that we already know how patients are going to do after surgery. And then we know when something's completely out of whack. So, you know, it really helps that we've been doing that together for a long time. Um, and again, I mentioned this earlier, but Presidex can increase respiratory rate. Again, it doesn't mean they're having pain, but you don't want to then over-treat them, especially with opioids during surgery. We're, we're almost zero, I think we're at zero percent opioids. In fact, definitely for 2022. So... 
Um, the other important thing when you tell patients about things, uh, it's interesting. Our anesthetic, our anesthesia, I tell people, is activating. It's not sedating. So most people are actually, obviously, they're walking around, they're peeing all night, but actually they feel really good even the next day when they come in. What you do have to tell people, though, is with our, the anesthesia we use, it is hard. I mean, the first night is very, very, <clears throat> it is a challenge to sleep. Um, but by the second night, they're usually okay. But it's an interesting, again, when we used to use gas anesthesia and opioids, people were barely making it into the office and kind of passing out and this and that. And now people are walking into the office and sometimes from pretty far distances because they want to be out doing stuff. So what's next? Um, these are things that we're obviously looking at. I'm very big into protein shakes and things like that. So we're going to start looking at, you know, can we do that and can we measure the hydration? Is there a way we can, you know, look at one versus the other and then do they complement each other or not? Um, optimize overall IV fluid intraop to minimize fluid shifts. I mean, the reality is we give patients a lot of IV fluids. Um, we do. And so we don't, oh, I've never, we've actually never had an issue ever with um, pulmonary edema or something like that. I've actually never, ever seen it. But we do give people, an average person will probably get, you know, on top of maybe six or more liters of um, tumescent solution, they'll probably get three to four liters of IV fluids during surgery. I like fluid overload. Um, the one thing we want to start looking at, though, is during our post-op IV hydration, should, we, should they be getting normal saline, lactated ringers, or should we start looking at other things to really re replete the electrolytes? And that's actually a big thing that we're looking at. Uh, we do take care of a lot of mast cell patients. So we do look at Benadryl. We do give them Benadryl, but it's interesting. I mean, some patients, you give them 50 milligrams of Benadryl and they'll sleep for a week. Other, you can give them 400 milligrams and it doesn't even touch them. So things that we're sort of starting to look at. And then I think ketamine is amazing. I, I really, really do. I know there's a lot of, it really works obviously for chronic pain, depression, things like that. So we really want to start looking at for these patients, if it's really going to be helpful. It's obviously helpful during surgery, but can we come up with a protocol that would be great? Great for after surgery as well. Um, so what it feels like to practice now. So again, I tell everybody, we're all on the same team. You know, I'm not the doctor and they have to do what I say. It, it's not that at all. We're all together. So we tell everybody, it, it's their own journey, but we're a part of it. So as long as we're all on the same page, it just works. It, it's really better for all. Um, intraoperative hemodyn hemodynamics are steady. It's really interesting. Our patients are higher BMI. Um, they've been told they have all these issues and stuff like that. And amazingly, if you look at our charts for these patients, you'd think we were making it up. They are completely steady. I mean, it, it, no matter what size, if it's up to 60 BMI, you know, the way we do things, it just seems like we're actually doing a better job for the patients. They're not going up and down with stuff. It's just, it's really interesting to see. Um, we are really good at obviously emerging and extubating people pretty quickly. We don't use, lat we don't use opioids and then having the whole team there. We also know when to stop things and stuff like that. And then the post-op care is quick and predictable. You know, everybody, again, everybody's following the same protocols and same things. So, you know, at least if you can get the 80-20 rule where it happens 80% of the time, that's great. You know, obviously you want to strive for the 100%, but, but really it's just nice when you have everything set up and you know what to expect and everyone knows what to expect. So our experience overall, and I just kind of want to talk about this. I did have to do one of these surgeries over at the hospital. And so I, I rarely ever go there, but I want to tell you that sort of our experience. I'm not saying this is for everyone. There's people that work exclusively at a hospital or, but what I see is, you know, I, when I go there, I meet the nurses and the anesthesiologists the same day that the patient does. So, and that's really, it's always tough for me because as I said, we have protocols and processes that we start early on. Um, we, with my chief of anesthesia, they're involved from the first consult. If we see a patient and we're worried about them, they have some medical issues, we'll start from the beginning and they're involved in their chart before they'll actually even clear them that they could have surgery with us. Um, if they need to, we'll call their primary care doctor, any specialist. I mean, we really do a full workup with everything to make sure. And again, it's not so much covering your ass or whatever. It's really the right thing to do. 
their primary doctors or their cardiologist or their renal doctor, they know the patients better than I do and better than we do. And so again, all looking at everybody on the same team, I just find it safer and better for all. Um, when I go to the hospital, I can't get, obviously I'm used to using the same thing over and over and over again. The hospital has their own equipment and things like that. So it, it's really been a challenge when I have to go there. Um, of course, our surgery center, we have the same setup for everything. It's the same thing over and over again. It just makes it life easier for all of us. Um, anesthesia, when you go to a hospital system and it's inpatient, of course, the same thing. There's some anesthesiologists that are okay with TIVA. There's others that aren't. There's others that don't like fluids. There's some that do. It's it, it's really a challenge where, you know, we even we study our patients here and study our outcomes. And so we have our own protocols that we do. Wake up and recovery. I mean, I'm sure most of us that when we're at the hospital, the first thing we do is say, okay, goodbye, go dictate. So, um, but for us here, we have one OR and one recovery. And so for us, it, it's kind of like we're always on the same team and really getting things moving. So, but it really does help for predictability. So we know, like they know as we're getting to the end of the case. I mean, I don't even have to tell them anymore because it's, it's really the same surgeries over and over and over again. But it's really great because we're always tailoring it. We're never snowing people completely. And, you know, if we can, some of these deep excavations. But more importantly, it's all part of the whole process. When I say multiple procedures, obviously a lot of these patients need more than one surgery or more than one procedure from us. So again, if I go to a hospital, I'm gonna to meet totally different people every single time. So for us, it's interesting because a lot of the same anesthesiologists will operate on the same patients, but even if they're not, we have a small team. It's the same charting, it's the same this. We look at every little thing and so they, it's just easy. You know, the first surgery I would say for lipedema, it's the hardest for both of for all of us, for them, for us. After that, it gets a lot, a lot easier because we know the patients they know what to expect. Uh, Post-care, of course, we all know you can write as many orders as you want in a hospital system and some will be covered, some won't. Uh, my patients will get, you know, they'll have every, I don't know, physical therapy, everything under the sun comes to see them. So, you know, with us, it's the same people. My ner the nurses are in the clinic, they're in the OR, it's the same people, we're all part of the same team and we're always doing that. And it, it's just, a, I feel like a better way and better patient care that way. Um, and outcomes, uh, there's many different variables, hard to control hospital. Again, this is not this is even surgery centers too that you can go to where it's, you don't really have a say with things. So it's really hard. However, we look at exactly what we're doing and we can change things, you know, if we need to, and we do. Every time if we find something's not working well, we'll obviously change that. Well, anyway, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Um, it's really great to talk about lipedema. And it's also great to talk about how we can safely do things in a higher BMI patients in an outpatient setting, which I honestly have seen and I really do believe it's the safest way to do procedures. So thank you for all your time.